Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Moretti and uh, I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions for the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse, New York. Our museum is still closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are looking at reopening later this month. Uh, so thanks for joining me today to learn about the lives of children on New York's canals. Uh, let's get started. So there's this, uh, this feeling of romance to the history of the Erie Canal, and I speak to a lot of museum visitors who have this sort of dreamy impression of the 19th and early 20th century canal. This is in contrast to both the realities of canal life as well as to the popular conception of the canal at the time. Working on the canal as a child was not always the carefree life of adventure that seems to be the collective cultural memory we now have of it, nor was it always the violent and dangerous life that was the popular idea at the time. The truth lies somewhere in the middle, and I hope to shed some light on that truth in this talk today by giving you some different perspectives. The sources used to develop this narrative included a history of childhood in America, oral history narratives from people who lived on or near the Erie Canal as children, and scholarly articles. So what are we going to talk about today? We'll start with an overview of the history of New York's canals, because it's always easier to fix the story to a place in time if you have the history of that place in time. From there, we'll talk about the idea of American childhood in the 19th and early 20th centuries. We'll talk about the work that kids did on the canal, especially on boats. We'll talk about recreation and growing up on both the 19th century canal and the current barge canal. And we'll talk about how the ideas of a canal childhood made it into popular culture and this collective memory of that that survives to today. Along the way, I have lots of great photos and other images from the history of the canal to show you. So let's get started. This is a canal map from 1854, which was uh, the peak of the canal years. This map shows various canals across the state, including the main Erie branch. Now, New York would not have become the Empire State if not for the creation of the Erie Canal. And there are three different iterations of New York's Erie Canal. Construction of the first original canal began July 4, 1817 at Rome, New York. It officially opened in full on October 26, 1825, although individual sections were open to use as soon as they were completed. The original, original canal was 363 miles long and crossed the state from the Hudson River to Lake Erie. Uh, it was 4 feet deep and 40 feet across. There were 83 locks in the system and these were to help uh, boats traverse the 570 feet of elevation change across the state. So this is the canal that was known as Clinton's Big Ditch. This was a derisive nickname at the time, but we use it at the museum in sort of an affectionate way. Clinton was DeWitt Clinton, the sixth governor of New York, who spearheaded the creation of the canal. The plan to create the canal was regarded by many as a pipe dream and, quite frankly, impossible, so Clinton took a lot of political heat for this idea that he promoted. As soon as the canal opened, it was pretty much immediately too small to address the traffic that it attracted. The enlargement projects on the canal began in the 1830s and lasted through the 1860s, with the resulting larger canal in use until the early 20th century when it was closed. The Erie Canal was increased in size. Uh, it was taken to 70 feet across and 7 feet deep, and 11 locks were taken out during this process, taking the total down to 72. Both the original and enlarged canals were movers of people and ideas, along with financial resources. A lot of people, um, especially new immigrants from Europe, traveled on the canal to the interior of the country up to the Great Lakes. I've talked to a lot of visitors who come from the upper Midwest, and uh, their ancestors traveled there by way of the Erie Canal. Nice of them to come visit the museum. The canal was responsible for the spread of a lot of new ideas as well, um, political movements, religious ideas, and during the peak years of the Erie Canal, the livelihoods of over 50,000 people depended on it. The enlarged canal was closed in the early 20th century and then filled in in a lot of places, including uh, in downtown Syracuse. There is no current canal through downtown Syracuse, although boaters can connect to the canal system by way of Onondaga Lake, just north of the city. Erie Boulevard, which is actually right outside the Erie Canal Museum, was once the enlarged Erie Canal, which explains why a lot of our visitors are a little confused when they come to the museum. You know, this is the Erie Canal Museum, where's the water? It's like, well, you, you drove on where it used to be to get here. So the current canal system, which is known popularly as the Barge Canal, was constructed beginning in 1905 and eventually opened May 10, 1918. This current system spans 524 miles and has four branches. So it still has the Erie Canal, but there's also a Cayuga Seneca branch, a Champlain branch, and an Oswego branch. This canal makes use of natural waterways um, for most of the state. This includes the Mohawk River. Um, these have had locks added to them. In western New York, there really aren't suitable natural waterways to support a canal system, so the canal sections out in that part of the state are man-made. And uh, they were made to a minimum width of 120 feet across and a minimum depth of 12 feet. The system has 57 locks in total. This is spanning the four branches. 
After the first few decades of the Barge Canal, commercial traffic uh, lessened, and these days it sees a lot more recreational traffic than business traffic. We get a lot of visitors to New York, you know, when, when things are normal, to see our canals. People come from all over the country, people come from all over the world. We have international visitorship at the museum, people that are interested in learning more about the canal and its history. So kids lived and worked on all three iterations of the New York Canal System. So now let's talk a little bit about childhood and about how our ideas of it have changed and evolved over time through the lens of spending one's childhood on or near the Erie Canal. So here in the early part of the 21st century, we tend to think of childhood as a predictable series of events, at least pre-pandemic. Kids these days, and when I say this phrase, I sort of feel as if I should be shaking my fist. They often attend preschool around the age of three or four. They start kindergarten at about five, middle school 11 or 12, and they finish high school at 17 or 18. This hasn't always been the course of an American childhood. At the time of the Erie Canal's initial construction in the early 19th century, the path to adulthood was undefined and highly variable. The social and economic changes in America at this time were creating all kinds of opportunities for school and work, and cultural shifts such as new religious movements were also a factor. And the Erie Canal was creating a revolution in transportation, creating new geographic mobility. Cities and towns that sprung up along the canal beckoned, and families picked up and moved in search of prosperity and a better life. Farms alongside the canal were established, cities grew, and gave new opportunities for work in factories, and families bought boats to travel the canal and make their livelihood. Meanwhile, this was also really the time that the idea of a modern childhood, meaning sheltered and free from labor, was born. In the culture at large, children were no longer regarded as merely adults in miniature, but as their own entities, with needs and abilities very different from those of adults. And children were viewed as figures of innocence, sullied only by their experience of the world. The role of their parents was to ensure that this innocence would not be corrupted. In practice, this translated to a longer expected period of childhood dependence on parental guidance. This idea came from the Romantic Movement, which originated in Europe at the end of the 18th century and peaked from about 1800 to 1850. The movement saw greater emphasis on emotions and the importance of the individual and came to affect philosophy and the arts of the time. The practice of these new ideas was based on the economics of individual families, however. Only a small fraction of well-to-do American families could strictly adhere to this new attitude, and most canal families were not especially well-to-do. Combining with this changing attitude towards what childhood was and should be, the birth rate sharply, de sharply declined as the 19th century wore on. At the beginning of the 19th century, a typical American mother gave birth to 7 to 10 children. This generally worked out to her having her first child in her early 20s, and having another every two years or so until menopause. The Quakers had been the first Americans to deliberately limit births, and by about 1810, this had spread to all parts of the country. The average birth rate fell to five children per family by 1850, and down to just three by 1900. Initially, the spacing between births was increased, and then later on, childbirths became fewer and were concentrated only to the early years of marriage, with women who married in the mid-19th century finishing their childbearing years earlier than those who'd married at the end of the 18th century. This reduction reflects the changing attitude towards children's role in the family unit. They were regarded less and less as a source of labor and more and more as social capital for the family, and they required vast amounts of time and resources to raise to adulthood. Of course, for canal boat families, the children were still a source of labor. But it would have been impractical for mothers to have as many children as would have been the norm before the canal era, as space on board boats was limited, the conditions were not the safest for children, and mothers would also be working on board the boat. As a result, young kids were often tied to the boat itself with a long rope. The 19th century also saw the creation of closer and closer sibling relationships. There were fewer children, they were closer in age altogether than a family's 10 children would have been in the previous century, and they often remained at home for longer together. And the closer quarters on a canal boat would have kept them in closer physical proximity by necessity. Several of the interviewees in the oral histories I used reflected upon the fun they had with their siblings as children. There was also an increasing emphasis on supposed social differences between boys and girls in the early 19th century. American boyhood in particular was defined as anti-domestic. Boys were free to roam and explore more so than girls, and their usual chores were often outside of adult oversight. Versus American girlhood was still viewed as a time of less responsibility before the crushing weight of motherhood and wifehood would begin, but there was more of this focus on the teaching of such tasks as cooking and sewing. Girls often were expected to care for their younger siblings. These differing roles for boys and girls were also found among the jobs done by children on canal boats. For example, a girl was much more likely to have a job in a boat's kitchen, while a boy might have been a mule driver. This is a classic photo, a canal family traveling under a bascule bridge in Rochester. So obviously the ideas and ideals sweeping the culture were in conflict with the reality in a lot of ways, so it's really no wonder that childhood in the early 19th century was often so chaotic. 
To be a child in canal days was to have more options available to you than ever before. And whether a child experienced the canal as a means to travel and adventure and freedom, or as a means to hard labor, depended upon their family's prosperity, or lack thereof. While middle-class children had a greater freedom to actually be children and be free from work and responsibility that came with it, poorer children went to work on the canal and alongside it, and their labor was vital to the survival of their families. A sheltered childhood was impossible for these children, and they were exploited for, these, for this purpose. So you really can't talk about canal childhood without talking in greater detail about child labor and some of the particulars of it in 19th century America. Immigrant children in particular made up a large percentage of the child labor force in the 19th century. Many of these children came from countries like Germany and Ireland, and their families had left Europe because of political unrest, economic upheaval, and in the case of Irish families, famine. This young man worked in a glass factory. Glass was one of the businesses which boomed on New York canals in cities like Canastota and Corning. I actually have a talk about this very subject that you can find on this YouTube channel. In the summer of 1845, the Irish potato crop was devastated by blight. In the following year, the crop was just 20% of what it had been in 1844. Within five years, 750,000 Irish died from starvation, and over a million immigrated to the United States. The popular idea that the Erie Canal was built by Irish laborers is partly true, but they worked on the Erie Canal's enlargement projects in vast numbers, rather than on the original construction period of 1817 to 1825. Most Irish immigrants remained fairly close to the port cities where they had landed, due to the financial inability to move elsewhere. They did come in large numbers to canal cities like Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo, and tens of thousands of residents of these cities report Irish heritage today. Children who came would have worked in canal cities and towns, in factories, or in businesses lateral to the canal. This is a work boat on the Black River Canal, which ran from Rome to Carthage uh, to connect the Black River to the main Erie Canal. The glamour of the Erie Canal was attractive to a lot of youthful workers, and to go to work on the canal was seen as in the same vein as running off to join the circus or jumping aboard a ship going to sea. Unfortunately, the reality of working on the canal wasn't quite so romantic. Children, be they immigrant or native-born, were definitely a prime labor source for canal boat operators. They would most often work as drivers and caretakers for horses and mules pulling the boats, as well as assistants on board, such as to the cook. The work was very physical, offered, involved long hours, and gained low pay, often around $10 a month and a sleeping space on board a boat. A church report in 1848 claimed that 10,000 boys were employed on New York's canals. Some of these children were orphans. They didn't have advocates. They could be easily taken advantage of by unscrupulous boat captains. This was especially true when wages weren't paid until the end of the canal season. Sometimes children would be cheated out of their earned pay and left to make their own way in the off-season. Sometimes kids would commit crimes in order to be locked up over the winter so they'd have a warm place to stay. The museum is home to a number of oral histories recorded in the latter half of the 20th century, and many of the people interviewed were children in the early 20th century and grew up on the canal, either living nearby or living on boats that their families owned. I turned to these as a resource for personal and local accounts of those who had lived and worked on the canal as kids. Children whose families owned canal boats had a better experience of working and living on the canal than did orphans. They had free time to play and explore as they traveled across the state. They would also often attend school during the winter, when the canal would close, and they were also taught on board by their mothers. Their young lives were marked by mobility, which made for quite a different experience of childhood than, than kids whose families were fixed to a geographic location. In my own mind, I've been thinking of it almost as comparable to kids growing up in military families now. Both of my parents were in the U.S. Air Force until I was eight years old, and we moved a lot. At least for canal families, if their boat was their home, it changed location with them. So let's learn a little bit more in detail about canal childhood. Many of the private boats on the canal, as in those not owned by shipping and transportation companies, were owned by families. For example, this boat is the steamer City of Fulton, which provided packet and freight services between Syracuse and Fulton on the Oswego Canal. This boat was owned and operated by the Burley family. This is a favorite photo in our collection, a boat passing through Rochester. I really love the expression on the little girl's face as well as her outfit. Everyone in the family would have a different role on board their boat. The father would captain the boat, while his wife would cook, clean, and care for the children. By the age of 10 or 12, kids were ready to become part of the boat's crew. There were a lot of jobs on board a boat, and kids could blow the signal horn, help to steer, cook, clean, or walk the mules or horses that pulled the boats. Driving the animals that pulled boats is certainly the most iconic of jobs that kids did on the canal. Here it is memorialized in bronze in our Tom Tischler sculpture across the street from the museum. Oral history interviewee James Droker reflected that he enjoyed this job and many kids regarded it as a privilege to get to care for and drive the mules. The drivers would work for six-hour shifts and then bring the mules back on board to be fed. 
Several interviewees recalled that the poor mules would sometimes get injured from their collars, and Austin Barnes, who lived in Syracuse and spent most of his childhood observing the goings-on of the canal, remembered that there was a man looking out for the well-being of the mules and arrested drivers and captains for using injured ones. Lolita O'Gillsby recalled her mother doting on the mules and putting a salve on their necks if they became injured. I'm really glad that people were looking out for the mules. I have a soft spot for them. I really love this idyllic image of a man and a boy fishing from the roof of a boat. This photo is of the Black River Canal. So life on board a boat was, cram was a cramped experience, but accounts uh, that we have seem to show that kids remembered the time fondly. Mrs. Elmer Darrow reflected that the cabin in her family's boat was wonderful and just like home. The sleeping quarters were sometimes below the water level, and according to Joe Wentworth, you'd hear these little eddies, the little circles of water gurgling. They'd gurgle you to sleep. That sounds like the ultimate white noise to me. The quarters were definitely cramped, though, and families had to be close-knit to get along. Richard Garrity, who lived on board his family's boat in the early 20th century, recalled that his father raised the bunk beds in the family's cabin so eight people would be able to sleep in that room. Even with this adaptation, there were just a few too many to sleep on their family boat, so Richard and his brother sometimes slept on a different boat that was connected to the families. This wonderful image is called Sunday on the Canal, and it comes from Harper's Weekly, published October 18, 1873. Canal boat families had relatively easy access to food and other needed supplies as they crossed the state. Stores and farmer stands alongside the water sold everything they needed, and there were even bum boats, which pulled up next to canal boats to sell their wares. As the trip progressed, boats usually ran into traffic to get through locks, and this was another opportunity for peddlers and salespeople to crowd onto the towpath to sell, and for people on board to hop off their boats and make a run for the shops. Drinking water was kept in barrels on board, as of course it couldn't be taken from the canal. The food the canal boat kids helped to prepare and ate was generally pretty simple. Food was prepared on board and often consisted of meat, potatoes, and vegetables. This is the image that always comes to my mind when I think about the safety of kids on board canal boats. Mrs. Bertha Grimes with her child. The canal was not without the risk of injury or illness for children. Drowning was always a fear, and kids would be tethered to the boat via ropes or even chains. Richard Garrity once fell off his family's boat, and luckily his father was watching and jumped in to save him. The boat didn't even stop for this, so Garrity and his father simply walked to the next bridge to get back on board. So I picked this nice cheerful photo for this slide because the subject matter in this part of the talk is less cheerful. Unfortunately, I don't have any information on this photo, like a year or a location, but I love it anyway. Illness was always a concern for children on the canal. If kids got sick on board their family's boat, they would sometimes be treated on board by their parents using home remedies or patent medicines. For example, here's a remedy for diarrhea credited to one Agnes Lake of Lockport from the early 20th century. One egg white beaten stiff, one teaspoon of castor oil, one teaspoon of paragoric, anhydrous opium, also known as tincture of morphine, five teaspoons of water. Mix well and give one teaspoon every two hours and less real bad than one teaspoon every hour. These days I think I prefer Pepto-Bismol myself. If they were really sick, kids would be taken to see a doctor in a canal side town. Illnesses traveled from place to place by way of people on the canal, and kids got sick with minor things like colds, but also more severe diseases like the measles, whooping cough, and cholera, which sickened and killed thousands across the state in the summer of 1832, and the first major epidemic that spread via the canal. This is a very instructive scene on board the canal boat Patty McLaughlin. Schooling was becoming increasingly important in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and canal boat children still needed to learn reading, writing, and math. They were taught on board the family boat by their parents during the canal's operating season, late spring through fall, and would be enrolled in classroom school the rest of the year. Said Richard Garrity, We always got our boats back to Tonawanda in the winter, and I went to school there, but we would leave not later than the middle of May, and I'd be taken out of school, all the family would, and I wouldn't return home until the end of November. So I used to miss, miss six, eight weeks of school. There was no problem. It wasn't compulsory then to be in school the whole term. Here's another scene uh, from Harper's Weekly. This shows boats in the off-season in the East River in New York City at Coenty Slip. Canal boat kids had time for fun. Life wasn't all just working and learning. And in fact, canal life offered the proximity and the chance to see and do many interesting sights and activities. Winter was a prime leisure time when the canal was closed. Every year, boats would berth together in different places along the canal, including New York City, as you can see in this image. I imagine this was a great opportunity to make friends with other kids. In the winter, the canal would be mostly drained, and the remaining water would freeze, creating opportunities for ice skating. And you know I have more images of that. So here's Rochester again. And uh, Syracuse, Clinton Square in particular. In warmer weather, canal swimming was another activity for kids. Uh, definitely not the smartest one, though. The bathroom on board a boat would have consisted of a bucket, and it was flushed by dumping it overboard. 
James Drocker, another oral history interviewee, described the water as being brown and dirty and full of garbage, but despite this, kids love to swim in it anyway. He also described canal-era children as being tougher than kids now. Byron Hall, who grew up in the Syracuse area, also recalled swimming in the canal, especially at night when everyone else was asleep. Thankfully, the canal also, also offered easier access to places that would have been safer and more pleasant to swim, such as Sylvan Beach. Here's some young ladies with a pleasure craft and a nice afternoon. The canal offered opportunities for enterprising young boaters as well. Byron Hall had fond memories of making canoes out of wooden cheese boxes to paddle in the canal. He and his friends would try to catch up to the large boats in their homemade contraptions. The canal was a great place to see big events and spectacles in cities along its length. The people lucky enough to be on boats had the best view of this hot air balloon launch in Clinton Square in the 1870s. The canal also offered access to amusement parks across the state, such as White City, which was on the western shore of Onondaga Lake and famous for its 25,000 electric lights. Here's an image of a water ride, the Shoot the Chutes, which carried guests down a steep ramp and into a man-made lagoon at the bottom. Even just being on the move across the state was excitement enough for kids. Florence Barney was born on a boat in 1886 and lived on board until she was seven. She remembered looking forward to coming up on the locks because that was when she and her sister would get off the boat to play alongside the canal. The locks would have flower gardens and sometimes the lock tenders would pick them a bouquet of flowers. I'll point out here that the museum's lock tenders garden uh, in, our, in our back garden replicates the sort of greenery a canal traveler would have seen in the late 19th century. The boat shown in this image, the William B. Kirk, was a steam packet that was used for leisure travel on the canal. I want to highlight life on the canal for kids whose families worked on the current canal system. The 20th century Erie Canal, or Barge Canal as it was better known then, opened in 1918 and didn't rely on animal power to move boats. Something else changed with the Barge Canal as well. Most boats were no longer owned or operated by families. I found a really excellent 1923 article about canal boat children in a publication called the Monthly Labor Review which surveyed families who lived and worked on canals in a few U.S. states, including New York. This article is illustrative of the differences between the lives of kids on the original and enlarged canals and that of those whose families worked on the barge canal. Truly, the golden age of canal childhood belonged to the enlarged canal, as you'll see. This image is from the Library of Congress. Uh, this is a mother and her child on a canal barge. By the time of the current canal system, very few children actually assisted in the operation of boats. There were no more mules to drive, and the steam-powered boats were too heavy for a child to steer. Child labor laws in the 1920s didn't refer to boat work specifically, but no child under the age of 14 was allowed to do any kind of work during school hours. All kids from family surveys surveyed were attending school, with those who had permanent winter homes having far better attendance than those whose families lived on board their boat. Over half of the kids overall, however, were in lower grades than what would have been normal for their age. So there was an increasing importance put on education for canal kids, but it was still a little delayed as compared to children whose families didn't work on the canal. So from that same set of Library of Congress photos, this one's from 1941. The access to supplies and medical care was largely similar to what it had been on the enlarged canal of the 19th century. Food could be secured at different stopping places along the canal, but fresh milk was noted to be one of the most difficult things to get for families. Some made no attempt to find it and relied on canned milk instead. Many of the families surveyed had very young children, so this lack of access to fresh dairy could be construed as a serious disadvantage for canal boat life. This is a map uh, from the New York State Canal Corporation show, to show it the four, 524 miles of current canal. Some of the medical concerns in the 19th century canal were, were the same as the 20th century. It could be difficult to get a doctor when needed when a boat wasn't in proximity to a canal side town or city. Crossing lakes such as Oneida or Champlain was noted as being a bad time to have a medical emergency on board. Many of the children in the family surveyed for the article had been born on boats, docked and with a doctor present in many cases. There was still a great risk of children falling overboard, and five of the families reported losing one or more children to drowning, so kids were still tethered to the family boat to mitigate this risk. To me, the most interesting takeaway from the survey was the prevailing attitude that families and children didn't belong on canal boats due to safety issues, inaccessibility of schools and medical care, and lack of opportunities for recreation. This was quite a shift away from the picture of the happy canaler family of the 19th century. In 1920 and 1921, attempts were made to secure legislation forbidding women and children on boats. Ostensibly, this was specifically for boats in New York Harbor, but the legislation was unrestricted by location, and had it passed, it would have affected all state waterways. So to close out our discussion today, I wanted to talk a little bit about some pop culture. In addition to the lived experiences of people who grew up on New York waterways, the notion of a canal childhood is found in some of the culture surrounding the Erie Canal. An example of this is the radio program Peter Absolute on the Erie Canal. 
The story takes place in the 19th century, and the Erie Canal Museum is home to some original scripts and material from the show, given to us by the executor of the estate of Mr. Arthur Anderson, who was a voice actor who brought the character of Peter to life when he was a young teenager. In the show, Peter escapes from a boarding school, where he was treated cruelly by the headmaster, and joins a theater company traveling on the canal. So here's this romantic notion of the canal as escapist and as a source of freedom for young people. An early example of children's fiction about the canal is Marco Paul's Travels on the Erie Canal, which was, for, which was written by Jacob Abbott and originally published in 1843. This work was part of a series called Marco Paul's Adventures in the Pursuit of Knowledge and consisted of young adult adventure stories that were also intended to be instructive. The title character of Marco Paul was a 12-year-old boy who took a trip on the canal in the 1840s with his 19-year-old cousin and tutor as a learning experience. In 1852, the Erie Canal volume was republished with more information and engraved illustrations shown here as well as in the next slide. So there's some more. So thank you very much for accompanying me on this journey through the history of New York canals as seen through the eyes of young people. So this is a very interesting presentation to research and assemble, and I really appreciate you guys checking out this video. Um, I'm going to leave you with a little song that a few oral history interviewees remembered hearing as children regarding the culture of the Erie Canal. Canaler, canaler, you'll never get rich. You'll die on the towpath, you son of a... <laughs> and you know how that ends. So perhaps canal kids didn't live like the Rockefellers, but they certainly experienced the sights and sounds of New York's changing landscape in the 19th century by way of the Erie Canal. Thank you again. Uh, if you are enjoying the content that the museum has been putting out during this very difficult time, we would appreciate your support. I'll put a link in the comment section for this video so you can uh, maybe become a member or make a tax-deductible donation to our annual fund. Thank you very much. Stay safe. I'm looking forward to seeing some visitors soon, so if that's going to be you after we reopen, looking forward to seeing you. Thanks.